Hello friends. In the previous sessions we had discussed different relative dating methods. We know that in case of relative dating scientists compare an object to other similar materials in order to establish a chronological timeline. But the relative dating techniques could only establish the sequence of events. For instance by determining the relative stratigraphic position of various kinds of fossils. But they could not tell whether a given sequence of events took place exactly 50,000 or 150,000 years ago. This is why modern scientists have developed different methods to determine the absolute age of materials. The absolute age of an object is a measure of how old it actually is in terms of years. This is much more desirable when constructing the timeline of our planet because it does not rely on comparisons to other materials. Instead of saying an object is older or younger than something else, scientists can simply report the age in years. Since scientists work with a variety of earth materials like rocks and fossils, there are different types of absolute dating methods. Some are useful in certain situations for certain materials, while the rest are perfect for other jobs. For example, one type of absolute dating may be perfect to figure out age of a bone fossil. Another method of dating might help in determining the age of a rock sample. So let's have a look at few prominent types of absolute age dating methods. We shall start with carbon dating which is otherwise also known as radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating is a subset of radioactive dating. Before we get into the core topic of carbon dating, we must have an idea on some of the topics like radioactivity, isotopes, half-life and all. Elements occur naturally in the earth and they can tell us a lot about our past. As shown in this illustration, each element is made up of atoms. and within each atom there is a central particle called the nucleus and the electrons surround the nucleus within the nucleus we find neutrons and protons two different atoms of an element can have equal number of protons while having different number of neutrons these different versions of the same element are called isotopes so isotopes are generally atoms which are having same number of protons but have a different number of neutrons now Atomic number of an element is equal to the number of protons and the atomic mass is the sum of protons plus neutrons so we can safely say that isotopes are elements with same atomic number but different mass numbers for example let's imagine a pair of identical twins these twins have the same temperament and since they are identical it is very hard to tell them apart unless you examine them very closely when we measure the weight of the twins we find that one weighs slightly more than the other In terms of chemistry we can say that these twins are like isotopes of each other similar in all other properties except the weight now isotopes are divided into two categories radioactive isotopes and stable isotopes stable isotopes have a stable combination of protons and neutrons so they have stable nuclei and they do not undergo decay while radioactive isotopes have an unstable combination of protons and neutrons so they have unstable nuclei and they are always trying to move to a more stable state so they do this by giving off radiation this process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by releasing radiation is called radioactive decay remember that radioactivity occurs only when the nucleus contains an excess amount of neutrons obviously when there is excess amount of neutrons it is unstable and this gives the radioactive nature to the isotope During radioactivity the unstable isotope breaks down and changes into a different substance a new more stable isotope called the decay or daughter product takes its place the isotope doesn't actually deteriorate it just changes into something else a more stable option see we are going through all these topics since we would be using these words frequently in our upcoming sessions so please stay focused next is radioactive half life The thing that makes radioactive decay process so valuable for determining the age of an object is that each radioactive isotope decays at its own fixed rate which is expressed in terms of its half life. So the decaying process follows a fixed path. This constant rate is known as half life. If we go by definition, the half life is the amount of time it takes for half of the atoms of a specific isotope to decay. For example, If you start off with 1000 radioactive nuclei with a half life of 10 days after 10 days you would have 500 left that is half of 1000 in the following 10 days this 500 becomes 250 so in two half lives that is 20 days 1000 becomes 250 and this continues 
as you can see in this chart, we have a radioactive substance with a half-life of 5 years. The substance initially has 100% of its atoms, but after its first half-life, that is 5 years, only 50% of the radioactive atoms are left. That's what half-life means. Literally, half of the substance is gone every 5 years. So in our example, after second half-life is over, that is 10 years, there will be half of 50% of the substance left, which is of course 25%. And after 3 half-lives, that is 15 years, there will be half of 25% of the substance left, which is 12.5%. And this pattern continues. The half-life is always the same regardless of how many nuclei you have left. And this very useful property lies at the heart of radiocarbon dating. So you see, scientists are able to use these half-lives of isotopes to date back materials thousands, millions or even billions of years old. The half-life is so predictable that it is also referred to as an atomic clock. So this is all about isotopes and half-life. Archaeologists and geologists use half-life to date the age of organic objects in a process known as carbon dating. Since all living things contain carbon, carbon-14 is a common isotope used to primarily date items that were once living. Now what is carbon-14? Like most elements occurring in nature, carbon exists in more than one isotopic form. It has three isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13 and carbon-14. These 12, 13, 14 correspond to the numbers of atomic weights of these isotopes. As you can see in this figure, carbon-12 has 6 protons and 6 neutrons. When one extra neutron is added to carbon-12, this becomes carbon-13. And similarly, when two neutrons are added to carbon-12 or one to carbon-13, it becomes carbon-14. Now carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable isotopes, which do not change. But carbon-14 is radioactive, which means it has an unstable atomic nucleus, which loses energy by radiation. Since carbon-14 is radioactive, it must have a half-life, right? So carbon-14 has a half-life of 5730 years, 5730 years. This means if there are 100 carbon-14 atoms on day 1, after 5730 years, there would be 50 carbon-14 atoms left. Now how this carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere? Carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. These rays are actually high energy particles rather than light rays which are electromagnetic radiation. They come zipping into the atmosphere from outer space and undergo various transformation which generate neutrons. These neutrons then collide with nitrogen nuclei, which is the most abundant element in the atmosphere, converting them into carbon-14 and an extra proton is spitted out. These high energy reactions leave the individual carbon-14 atoms with a lot of kinetic energy, causing them to crash into many other atoms or molecules in the air. They eventually join with oxygen to form carbon monoxide, which can then be oxidized into carbon dioxide. During photosynthesis, living plants take in carbon dioxide from the air, energy from the sun, and water from the ground to make the building blocks of life. Now the carbon dioxide taken by the plants during photosynthesis contain all these three isotopes of carbon. Since the carbon-13 and carbon-14 are slightly heavier, the plants prefer to use lighter isotopes of carbon, which is carbon-12. So in order of preference, carbon-12 is preferred over carbon-13 and carbon-13 is preferred over carbon-14 during photosynthesis. So if you take a plant and measure what isotopes it has, you would find that it would be slightly richer in carbon-12 than the naturally occurring background ratios. So it might have around 99.2% of carbon-12, 0.8% of carbon-13 and only one atom in a million millions of atoms of carbon will be that of isotope carbon-14. And since animals eat plant, their isotopic ratios would be similar to the plants. In this way, the carbon-14 enters into the food chain of animals and finally to the humans. When dating with carbon-14, scientists compare the amount of carbon-14 to carbon-12. These are both isotopes of element carbon present in a constant ratio when the organism is living. However, once the organism dies, they stop taking in carbon-14 and the amount present starts to decrease at a constant half-life rate. By knowing how much carbon-14 is left in a sample, the age of an organism and when it died can be worked out. Now this radiocarbon dating can be used to date back items as far as about uh, 50,000 years old. Why so? The graph below shows the decay curve, you may recognize it as an exponential decay 
and it shows the amount or percentage of carbon-14 remaining. We know that half-life of carbon is 5730 years. You will notice in this graph that around 40,000 years, that is 8 half-lives. 8 half-lives in the sense 8 into 5730, that is approximately 40,000 years. The amount left is starting to become very small, almost less than 1%. Scientists often use the value of 10 half-lives to indicate when a radioactive isotope will be gone or rather when a very negligible amount is still left. This is why radiocarbon dating is only useful for dating objects up to around 50,000 years old that is about 10 half-lives. Please note that this method is applicable only to matter which was once living and which is presumed to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere. Now you might think that if the atmospheric nitrogen is continuously bombarded with cosmic rays and converted to carbon-14, then as time passes by, the concentration of carbon-14 should have increased with corresponding decrease in the concentration of nitrogen. But this doesn't happen. Radioactive carbon-14 is continuously formed in the atmosphere by the bombardment of cosmic ray neutrons on nitrogen-14 atoms. After it forms, carbon-14 is absorbed by the plants and when the plants die, the carbon-14 naturally decays and eventually, given enough time, virtually all of the carbon-14 will convert to nitrogen. If we dig them up some millions of years later and measure the isotopes, they will just have carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes. The carbon-14 would already have been depleted. Now look at this diagram. Image 1 shows carbon-14 production by high-energy neutrons hitting the nitrogen-14 atoms. In the image 2, you can see carbon-14 naturally decomposes through beta particle production. Notice that the nitrogen-14 atom is recreated and goes back into the cycle. Over the lifetime of the universe, these two opposite processes have come into balance, resulting in the amount of carbon-14 present in the atmosphere remaining about constant. However, this cyclic process is getting twisted and the carbon-14 concentration is getting reduced. You see, tons and tons of plant material get buried and compressed over vast stretches of geologic time. By the time we dig them up, any carbon-14 that was there has long since decayed. So when we burn these fossil fuels, the carbon we are adding to the atmosphere is enriched in carbon-12 and carbon-13 but depleted of carbon-14. So ultimately what happens is that, when we measure the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, we can see that over the last 100 years or so, the natural background ratios of carbon-12, 13 and 14 are getting more and more twisted towards more carbon-12 and less carbon-13 and lesser carbon-14. This is one of the many lines of evidence which show that rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is caused by the burning of fossil fuels. So this is all about radiocarbon dating. Well, I guess we made through a lot of science here. This will suffice for now. Meet you in the next video. I hope you found this video informative. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Thanks for watching.